Hello and welcome to Global Thinkers Forum's podcast, Conversations with Changemakers. Global Thinkers Forum is an international non-profit organization founded by Elizabeth Filippouli with a timely mission to nurture accountability in leadership and support youth and women through mentoring. The organization is non-political and non-partisan. I am Grazia Giuliani, and I am an author and a researcher, and I am the guest host in this episode, and I will be in conversation with Dr. Philip Hopley, consultant psychiatrist at Cognacity in London and honorary senior lecturer at UCL. We will focus on empowering psychological tools against the COVID-19 crisis. Philip, thank you very much for joining us today. And I am really looking forward to receiving your guidance as a person, as a mother. And I know that all our audience will also like to receive your guidance as mothers, fathers, parents, creative people, business people. So how do we tackle these crisis? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today, Grazia. Lovely to be in conversation with you. Um, just a tiny bit about my experience here. So I'm also a father. I have four children and I run a business that helps organizations and individuals deal with a range of challenges, whether they be life events, whether they be mental health problems. And of course, COVID is presenting us with some really um, unparalleled challenges for our time. So it's an important area to look at. Starting from family, um, how does family status quo and subsequently balance change when the entire family has to stay at home and in lockdown circumstances? Well, Gracia, I think it changes in many ways. We can't predict it. It's going to be different across the board for different families, different groups, different circumstances. And there can be ups and there can be downs. We have four children here in the house, my wife and I. So uh, it's not always plain sailing. It's not always as smooth as it would like to be. But what we're seeing is an opportunity to find a new balance, to look at a new status quo. One of the big challenges is how do we fill our time? And for children of school age, how do we recreate for them that academic or educational commitment that's required? And schools are doing a good job in the UK, at least, of creating virtual learning platforms. But we're effectively moving from parents who would spend time outside of school hours with their children to parents who spend all of their time with their children. So it's important not only to look at learning and education, but also chores, who's doing what around the house, exercise, playing, rest, sleep, all of these core activities. And my advice is 100% to have structure to certainly the Monday to Friday routine. People need to be getting themselves up on a regular basis at a consistent time getting dressed as if you would for, for work or as if you would for school, maybe not in your school uniform, but not lounging around in your pyjamas for a few hours where motivation slides and you don't feel that inclination to do anything. So we need structure and we need some kind of approach that's going to make it very clear to our children what the expectations are, certainly on the weekdays. Can you give us three practical examples for different age groups from young children to late adolescents? And let's pick learning, chores, um, just to give age-appropriate responsibility to the children, and sleep routine, which always seems to be a great difficulty in many households and families. Yes, of course. And Gracia, I'll start with sleep because it's the same, whatever the age of the children, and let's be honest, of the adults as well. Um, having some expectations around fixed bedtimes, or at least a range of bedtimes, is really important. Um, younger children absolutely need this. They need to get whatever their eight or nine hours of sleep would be. Otherwise, we'll see them getting tired and irritable and harder to look after during the day. It's a bit more challenging with adolescents because their body clock tends to push them towards a later bedtime and a later wake-up time. But my advice still is to try to be consistent, particularly if you've got a family where there are children spanning these different age groups. We want to be doing things consistently together. So that's, that's the thing for sleep. Learning, a lot of the schools, as I said earlier, have got platforms that are there. Just remember that classrooms and timetables are structured to have fixed periods of learning. 
35 to 40 minutes usually because our attention span regardless of our age is fixed we get kind of a full brain after half an hour 35 minutes so we do need to take regular breaks during the day and for all children we need to blend that with the need for exercise and play and finally i would say regarding chores you have to be age savvy about what's going to be happening here but it's a great opportunity for children who might have an interest in cooking who haven't done that regularly to get involved in that a few times a week uh, those who've got pets like dogs that need to be walked, it's usually the stay home parental carer that has to do that Monday to Friday. We'll share that around because it's so important we keep active and keep exercising. And even the more mundane things, you know, the, the hoovering, loading the dishwasher, washing up after dinner, laying the table. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your state of life is. It's a very good founding to have an experience of this. And I think most children will have a greater appreciation of what parents do having gone through this. Absolutely. No, it's very true. And the motivation as well, that's another important factor. Drawing from, from conversations with parents of late teenagers between 17 and 19, uh, during these last coronavirus weeks, some of them are fighting against staying in good spirits. They lose motivation of doing anything. And uh, when they can, they find refuge under the duvet. Some of these teenagers are teenagers who so far have lived a privileged life in a highly stimulating school environment with top results and university offers to choose from. So let's say they've had it all. Where their status falls and fails them is family governance, by which I mean the ability of a family to function based on open, honest and balanced communication where parents are the educators and the providers. And the children feel safe to engage in discussions and problem solving, retaining respect for their parental figures. So family seen as the safe haven from society, which can indeed differ on many levels, as in some families we know that not all members have a voice. At the other end of the scale, there are adolescents who have to deal not only with poor family governance, but also with poverty, both financial and intellectual, where they are starved not only from food nourishment, but also from intellectual educational nourishment, let alone lack of love and complex family situations. Now, to, to add to the mix, COVID-19 which is stripping them from any hope of the dreams, possibilities and opportunities of a more stable future. As you know, Philip, there is a lot of fear out there. There is the fear of the invisible, the virus, and, and there is the fear of the unknown. Now, in this complex situation, your view and your advice on parental approach would be highly appreciated. Certainly. Um... In terms of fear, I think it is across the board affecting everybody. And for me as a psychiatrist, but also increasingly as a well-being expert, you know, trying to educate people so that we can prevent people developing mental health problems. They can take the steps to make themselves more resilient and more protected against what's happening. For me, this all comes down to perspective. And as Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher and former slave said nearly 2000 years ago, we are disturbed not by things, but by the views we take of them. In other words, it's our interpretation of the challenges and events that are around us that will shape how we respond. And this is the same for any human being, any age, background, gender, race, or belief set. None of us are different. It doesn't matter whether you have a privileged background or an underprivileged background. Our mental functionings are really exactly the same. And you're right definitely fear is destructive and it can strip away hope. But at the same time, whilst there's a lot of scaremongering about what might be coming down the line, the truth is we don't know what to expect. And we do know, and it's important to stick to the facts here, that humanity has bounced back from many disasters over many centuries. There's something very resilient and enduring about the human spirit. And I think it's really encouraging to recognise and remember, remember that. So if we have an ability to take a different perspective on what's happening, 
This also means that our behavioral choices can be influenced in that way. Yes, we have a choice to hide under the duvet, but equally, our adolescents have the choice to actively connect with friends, find constructive ways to help others, learn new skills, find new areas of interest, all by keeping things in proportion, keeping that perspective there. There are so many things that we can do to cope better. And my belief, my strong and firm belief, is that as parents or as friends of others, it's not only our duty to help our children and friends, but it's our privilege to be able to do so. This is, you know, part of the, if you like, the blessing or the kind of responsibility that comes with this amazing position. We know that humans are social beings and we know that they thrive not in isolation, but in cooperation. But the paradox is that when we become more stressed, we tend to pull away from others. And we do this inadvertently, throwing away one of the most important support mechanisms or structures that we have as, as, a, as an entity. So it's really important as parents that we keep our eyes peeled for any of these developments like this. And we do our best to keep things in proportion, help that perspective there, and enable our children to see what's happening around us, not hide them from it, but be balanced about it and be positive in the way that we come across to them. These obviously being humans, um, well, working better when they are social beings and in cooperation, that requires communication. So our only communication with the outside world these days is online. And so with this kind of communication, which is not really human in a way, are there dangers for adolescents and how can parents be more alerted? Yes, first of all, I mean, it's a really good observation. First of all, my experience in the last month as a psychiatrist uh, looking after a number of patients, but now having to work remotely, is that whilst we lose some of the real human connection and we lose perhaps some of that kind of that sixth sense that we pick up from nonverbal communications um, by working down communication streams such as we're using today, by no means does it um, negate or completely undermine those approaches. So having an ability to be in contact with others via Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever that platform would be, is a great start, I would say. It kind of counters against that tendency towards social isolation. Specifically in terms of what happens to adolescents, the research literature shows a mixed picture. Many people have heard the stories or read some of the um, maybe slightly exaggerated stories about how social media is evil and somehow is driving high levels of anxiety in teenagers. Now, we know that there is a connection between people becoming overly preoccupied with that perfect view of the world that Facebook, Instagram might encourage people to put out there. But actually, the evidence is not all one way here. Part of the evidence shows us that having connection with others is actually a very pro-social and protective factor. I think the difficulty arises later on in life, and I've seen this in clinical practice where Children who have functioned well at home and at school then make that transition to leaving home, often to go on to universities, further education or employment, but they're moving away from that stable home base that we've talked about. And I think it's in that circumstance that perhaps having been over-reliant on virtual connectivity, using apps and tools that make that easier, I think that's one of the areas where humans at that age struggle. And so connecting and making friendship groups in the real world, in real time, face to face, is a difficulty for them. So we see slightly increased levels of anxiety and depression in that cohort. What is my advice? Well, my advice is that balance is the key. Dialogue is all important. When it comes to parenting children around their use of technology, I think we have to be kind of age respectful. So very young children need firm guidance, clear boundaries, rules, if you like. Once those children move into their teenage and adolescent years, it becomes more of a negotiation and individual parents will know their children's thinking styles and their children's ability to resist the seductive and addictive qualities that a lot of the apps and games and other things on these devices are. I remember when our eldest two went to their secondary schools, they would, they would have started around the age of 11 and we had sort of kept them 
away from devices up until that stage and away from things like Facebook, etc. The new headmistress came in and one of the pieces of advice she gave was to not allow children to have their devices in their bedrooms. And we followed through on that. And we personally found that very helpful. That's not to say that that's the only approach, but there's certainly a need for those younger children to be given a very clear steer on what this is. As the children have got older, we've tried to engage with them in a dialogue and an understanding of what our expectations would be and how we expect them as developing adolescents, becoming adults, to take on responsibility and ownership for ensuring that these devices are used for their best outputs and don't become a source of continual distraction, don't disrupt their academic progress, don't become something that actually becomes so addictive that they can't pull themselves away from it. And to be honest with you, even though I'm an expert in the field and my wife is a former doctor as well, Grazia, it's been a real challenge because these devices are so addictive. So my advice is to try to find a balanced way forward and enable the children to see what the downfalls of being overly plugged into these technologies are. And then to, if possible, bring in collateral supportive voices. That might be uncles and aunts. It might be people that the children don't perceive as being quite so controlling and prison governor-like, people that they would respect and listen to. Um, and working at that collaboratively is definitely the way to go. In terms of information sharing, I think the right thing to do in terms of COVID is try to steer children and ourselves as adults to just getting one dose of reliable news feed per day. We could spend hour after hour looking at what's happening, but it just tends to push up anxiety levels. Yes, absolutely. And is within the family environment and also within the business environment itself, because it is on every level. Um, and considering that you also specialize in business leaders, um, I would like to move from family to uh, business now, especially with, with these new concerns and stress that business leaders are currently under. So could you please talk to us about this subject too? And we can, we can choose these, you know, to have this vision as from a girl to a woman business leader. Are there common fears shared and parallels drawn in the uncertainty of the coronavirus, no matter the age and the development or evolvement of a person? Yes, absolutely. In terms of the latter point, as I said earlier, Grazi, there's no doubt that as human beings, we have this hardwired system which has been part of our evolutionary survival process, the, the limbic system, the fight flight response, to respond in a certain way to threat. And COVID is clearly a threat on many levels, health, economically, et cetera, et cetera. The, the crucial thing here, and this is where as a business we've become well-respected as experts, is to recognize that short-term acute stress or threats is very manageable. The human brain is very adept at dealing with that. The problem arises when these threats become continuous or chronic. Now, humans, unfortunately, compared to the rest of the uh, an animal and mammal world, have this unique ability to carry around in our memories with us feelings and thoughts and, and emotions associated with previous bad experiences. So our brains, if you like, our computers have got that ability to keep things on repeat. And that's problematic because it pushes us into a chronic stress or chronic threat state. And that's where we see people moving towards stress-related mental health problems, eventually anxiety and depression. And what we're hearing from business leaders, and perhaps this is not surprising because these are humans just working in different settings, is that anxiety has been the biggest challenge that they've seen for themselves and for their employees. Anxiety about our health, this is a potentially fatal virus that's going around. We see on a daily basis the mortality rates and the morbidity rates. So people are understandably worried about their own health. Maybe if they're healthy, their concern is more about family members, older generations, people with underlying health problems or health problems for their employees. Then, of course, when you move forward from just thinking about the, the health problems, you've then got a whole cohort of people who are working from home and having to adapt and adjust to, for many people, a very new way of working. Yes, there's been flexible working for many years, but not to the extent we're seeing now. So some of the business leaders we work with are maybe worried about people's productivity and what will happen to their health if there's less visibility and connectedness between team leaders and teams themselves. We give them very clear guidance on the importance of staying connected through all these different 
channels we've been talking about already, but also changing the focus slightly in terms of what people talk about. And catch up shouldn't really purely be about business these days because business and productivity is really now a function of our well being. So we need to be checking in with each other. How are we doing on a weekly basis? Are there any things that are happening significantly? We will, if we haven't seen it already, be in touch with family members, friends, or work colleagues who are dealing with bereavement because high numbers of people across the world are dying from COVID. So having that sense of togetherness and moving towards a goal of supporting each other and being very open about things is really crucially important. And as time goes on, we will see, I'm sure, different themes arrive. I've just, I've just mentioned bereavement there. There will be other issues and challenges, perhaps such as boredom translating into lack of motivation, translating into depression over time. And the best thing we can do in these circumstances is recognize this in ourselves and others at the earliest stage and ask for help or offer help. Absolutely, Philip. That, that's, that's very, very clear. Your message is very clear. And also it touches to, on to, to the point of behavior, of individual behavior. And a common behavior of staying at home shared by many people seem to be eating and drinking habits. Some people have started binging as a reflection of their emotions or reducing their food intake because of financial worries, so bordering financial anorexia. Others find themselves drinking more alcohol in the evening more than they used to. So after the coronavirus has passed, we will be faced with more eating disorders and alcohol addiction issues to be tackled. And can you give us tools to prevent these habits from happening? Yes, certainly, Grazia. I mean, there have been some interesting observations. I would say even before we get into what will happen post-COVID, uh, it's important to look at how fear and emotional states drives behavior. Uh, you'll remember, I'm sure you'll have seen this in the UK, and I'm sure it's been the same in other countries, that there was this period of panic buying at the outset of people being put into um, social isolation and, and being on restrictions to stay at home. That, that was fascinating because, you know, people had this sense that these crucial things would run out. And for some reason in the UK, toilet paper became the obsession of choice and stocks of toilet paper ran out very quickly and people were fighting in supermarkets over toilet paper. And we could read into that what we will. But what was happening there was that an emotional response was driving behavior. And this is the same as we're seeing for people who now, presumably because their larders are very well stocked through all of that panic buying in the early stages, have the opportunity to eat in a different way and drink in a different way to as they would have done before. We've had removed from people that routine, that structure I talked about earlier in this discussion. So it's really important that people, A, have an awareness of that and think about structuring the day and when they would have their meals in line with what would have happened pre-COVID but also maybe think about how they can help each other within families, looking at snacking. You, you can see when people are snacking more than they should do. And without criticizing, you can try and explore whether there are more healthy snacks or ways of structuring the time that snacks are taken that would be helpful. And I think if we're seen to be doing this together rather than isolation, then it can become a positive. So one of the ways in which people can positively reframe what's happening with COVID is that it's an amazing opportunity for people who are no longer traveling to work to have, let's say, eight to 12 hours per week of time back to use as they wish. And my recommendations depend on people's lifestyle choices, but would be look at sleep. You know, if you can sleep some more, definitely be sleeping some more. Exercise, definitely be exercising more. Even if you're restricted as to where you can do that, getting regular exercise in is so important for our physical and also our mental well-being. And if we're looking after ourselves in these ways, we're probably going to be less likely to let slip the standards around eating as well. On the point of the addictive behaviors, now this is a very interesting observation. A number of my clients who have struggled over the years with alcohol and recreational drug misuse or addiction have found that being under lockdown has been very positive for them. It's almost, if you like, been a form of informal residential rehabilitation. They've been unable to leave the presence of another group of people. Everybody is interested in everybody staying well. And so the kind of devious and the kind of sneaky behaviors of obtaining alcohol or obtaining recreational drugs become much, much harder to do. 
and a number of those people think that this is a big positive for them. In terms of the future, well, as I said before, we really can't predict what's going to be happening. Um, but because we've seen people with these existing problems maybe doing a little bit better under these lockdown circumstances, I'm hopeful that there'll be some lessons we can take away as individuals and as groups and as families that could maybe make us a little bit more smart in terms of anticipating where these difficulties may arise in the future. The concept of eating or drinking or using drugs to self-manage our emotions is well recognized, but that's a dysfunctional coping strategy. So here we have the opportunity to look at those dysfunctional coping strategies, adapt them and become much more functional. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And um, we are reaching um, the closure of our conversation. And I really would love to close um, this podcast on a very positive note, because we really need positivity to go forward and to strive forward. So in, in the longer term, what do you see as the most severe psychological effect of this crisis in our society? But also, what do you see as the solution or at least the offer that can be given to people not only people living within a family environment but also people who live by themselves at home could you please give us you know, your, your overview in terms of psychological effect as an aftermath of the crisis and also a way to tackle it of course now grazie if we had been having this crisis 10 years ago the conversation you and I would be having today would be very different. And the reason for that is that stigma is starting to fall away in most societies around mental health. 10 years ago, it would have been very difficult to talk about these things because people were less confident to talk about it. I think that although we anticipate seeing what some people are referring to as the fourth wave, this kind of peak of psychological health problems after lockdown because of the impact on the economy, which will probably be, as I've said already, stress-related mental health problems, anxiety and depression. I think that the big, the big plus here is that people are much more open about sharing their feelings. We're spending much more time with our families, which read, prevents or offers the opportunity for dialogues that we might not have had before because we're so busy living our lives and living our lives separated. And so I think that the opportunity is here to get much better at looking out for ourselves, looking out for others, talking openly about the challenges that face us. And because of that improved self-awareness and those, if you like, opportunities to intervene at an earlier stage, we know from research that mental health conditions, when they develop, the outcomes are better if you pick them up sooner. So I think there could be a significant societal shift in a healthy direction in terms of group or population mental health going forward. Thank you, Philip. This really gave us hope because we need to keep the positivity. We need to keep that light still shining. So thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. I would like to thank you all for listening to Global Thinkers Forum's conversation with Changemakers today. I am Grazie Giuliani and I was the guest host for today's episode. You can find more information about the organization by visiting www.globalthinkersforum.org and you can get in touch and please do get in touch. We really value your input through info at globalthinkersforum.org. Keep well and thank you very much indeed again for listening. Mm -hmm.